Let's take a look at this problem. So a cylindrical tank having a diameter of 270 centimeters, maybe we introduce cap D for the diameter of the tank and 270 centimeters or 2.7 meters and a height of 8 meters. So we'll just maybe put in H equal to 8 meters. Water exits through a 1.9 centimeter diameter pipe located at the bottom of the tank. Well, here's a smaller diameter pipe. Maybe we'll use lowercase d, and that's 1.9 centimeters or 0 0.019 meter diameter for that pipe. The velocity <laughs> of the water exiting varies as square root of that one half power went down here, but it's the square root of 2gz. So the velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times g times z. What is z? z is the height of the water in the tank. So as the height of the water in the tank is, is large, the tank is full, uh, then it comes out faster with a greater speed. Uh, when the z is small, then it comes out uh, not as fast, it's slower. Okay, the water level uh, starts with the 40 cubic meters of initial volume. So let's use uh, subscripts one and two. And so one will be the initial and two will be the final. So the volume one is uh, 40 meter cubed. And it drains until it has a final volume, uh, V2 of uh, five cubic meters of water in a tank. So it says, determine the initial height of the water in the tank. So what we're asked to find is Z1, right? Z1 is Z for height of the water in the tank and one for initial. And then for part B, the initial velocity of the water exiting the tank, uh, V1. Now again, uh, volume and velocity can be easily confused. So this is speed and uh, this is volume, whatever notation we want. Uh, I'll get to part C, D, and E, but let's answer part A first. So if I wanted to get that initial height, well, I know that the initial volume is equal to the cross-sectional area times the initial height. Isn't that true? So Z1 is just the initial volume divided by the cross-sectional area. So 40 meter cubed divided by the cross-sectional area of a tank of diameter 2.7 meters is pi d squared 2.7 meter squared over 4. And so we calculate z1 to be right at 6.99 meters, a skosh under 7 meters. So it's almost full. The total height of the tank is 8 meters and it's 6.99 meters to start with. Part B, what is the initial velocity of water exiting the tank? Well, V1 is given by the square root of two times G times Z1. So that's equal to, let me put it down here, two times 9.81 meters per second squared times 6.9862 three meters, that's all the digits on Z1. And we find that V1, the exit speed initially, comes out at 11.7 meters per second. Now let's take a look at part C. The final height of the water in the tank. Well, they give us the final volume and we did the same equation. So the final height is equal to the final volume divided by the area and the final height comes in at 0 0.873 meters. So the water starts at nearly 7 or right at 7 meters and it falls to less than 1 meter elevation in the tank while it's draining. Part D final velocity. Well, the final velocity, same type of equation, square root of 2gz, square root of 2gz2, 
and you find that the final velocity isn't 11.7 meters per second anymore, it comes out at 4.14 meters per second. So it's a lot slower, isn't it? It's slower coming out at the, at the end of that time when it's now the, vol the volume is only 5 cubic meters in the tank. All right, now let's take a look at the last one. What is the time it takes to drain from the initial state to the final state from 40 cubic meters to 5 cubic meters in the tank? So we're asked to find that time. Now, what we do is we have a control volume. There's our control volume. It's basically the tank. And we write our mass balance equation for water, and we find that the rate of change of mass and the control volume with respect to time is equal to a negative rate at which it flows exiting out. There's no inflow. It's just an outflow, right? And then we say, okay, well, what's the mass of the water and the control volume? Well, it'll be that volume times the density. And that volume is going to be the area times the height. Isn't that area, the cross-sectional area of the tank times the height times the density? Isn't that the mass of the water and the control volume? And then we have a time derivative of that. And then it's negative outflow, rho, times the exit velocity. Uh, this exit velocity, because I already have an A for the area of the tank, which is pi d squared over 4, maybe I'll have, um, maybe I'll, uh, uh, the area of the hole, the area for the, the hole is pi d squared over 4. It's a much smaller cross-sectional area for the hole. So we're going to have the area of the hole times the velocity exiting. So that's rho AV. Isn't that a net outflow? Okay. So uh, that area can come outside. The rows cancel. I'm going to run out of room, so I'm going to have to scoot down a little bit. I don't like to do that, but um, I'm going to put in the pi d squared over 4 times the time derivative of the elevation of water in the tank is equal to minus pi lowercase d squared over 4 times the square root of 2 g z. We can cancel the pi and the 4, and we have an, basically a an differential equation, something like you solve in EA1. True. So I'm, I need more space, so sorry, but I'm going to have to scroll down to get more space. Pardon? Yeah, as soon as I scroll down, somebody wants to see what was just taken away from the screen. So I scroll down, and what I want to do is I want to say I have the derivative of the elevation in the tank is equal to uh, minus lowercase d over cap d squared, and I'll have the square root of 2g, and I'll have z to the one-half. Why did I write it like that? I don't know. Just to hopefully clarify, because I'm going to do what now? Separate and integrate. <laughs> True? And so we're going to have uh, z to the minus one-half dz equal to minus, leaving symbols. True? And what did we have for initial condition? Well, the initial condition is the, that z at time 0 is equal to z1. It just starts from some initial height in the tank. And then oh, we can get now the height as a function of time. So when we integrate, um, what we find is that we're going to integrate. And all those are constants, so I'll just move them outside the integral there. And we'll integrate from z1, initial time 0, to some final z as a function of time. Some function of time. You can sometimes put in your limits right in the, uh, the initial conditions or the boundary conditions right in the 
limits there of the integration. Otherwise, put in a constant of integration and go back and solve for that constant. But let's go ahead and do this side right here. Is that uh, z to the 1 half, 2 times z to the 1 half? Did I do that integration right? If I differentiate 2 times z to the 1 half, do I get z to the minus 1 half? Oh, so I think that's correct. And we're going to go from z1 to z as a function of time. We have all this constant d over cap d squared, square root of 2g. And then we're going to have t minus 0. And so what we're going to have is, um, if you let me do it this way, z to the 1 half minus z1 to the 1 half is equal to minus d over cap d quantity squared divided by g over 2. I brought that, that 2 over, okay, and times t. How does it feel? using some of those mathematical skills that you struggled so hard to acquire, right? And so uh, you can keep on. You can put z is equal to z1 to the 1 half minus d over cap d squared square root of g divided by 2 time. Uh, hold it. Not square root. Squared. Well, here is z as a function of t. So here is uh, z as a function of t. Or, just as you suggest, let's solve for t. So t is a function of z. So then you have z to the 1 half minus z1 to the 1 half divided by, oh boy, uh, maybe I'll switch the minus sign, get rid of that minus sign, right? z1 to the 1 half minus z to the 1 half divided by d over cap d squared, square root of g over 2. Look good? I took this 2 right here, and I wanted to bring it to the other side. See what I did? Yeah. I'm trying to conserve space on the board. But at this point, we can now substitute our numbers. Z1 was initially uh, 6.99. We'll do the square root of that. Subtract the final height, which was Z2, uh, 0.8733, square root of that, divided by the diameter of the uh, hole, 0.019 meter, divided by the diameter of the tank, which was 2.7. Both diameters are squared square root of uh, 9.81 uh, meters per second squared. And what we're going to find is both of these up here have the square root of meter as a unit. And you get the seconds finally. The, the time, chase the units. It's careful. Be careful with the units, but you'll find that they come out to be 15580 seconds. That's a long time. 15,580 seconds. G divided by 2. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I have it right there. Okay. And so um, here's a plot. So it starts at just a skosh under 7, 6.99. It ends at uh, a little bit under 1, which was uh, 0.8733. It starts at time 0, takes 15,580 seconds. More than 14,000, but less than 16,000 seconds. Almost 16,000 seconds. Uh, this profile, is it a straight line? No, but it's close. Somebody says, uh, <coughs> can you make an approximation? Well, what was our average velocity? It was initially coming out at 11.7. At the end, it came out at 4.14. 4. 
The average velocity, just an approximation, is around 7.92 meters per second. The mathematician's done. The engineer wants to double check his work. So, hey, if that's the average velocity coming out over the time period, the average flow rate is going to be 0 0.00225 cubic meters per second. Hence, the draining time would be how much needs to come out, 35 meter cube, 40 to 5, that's 35 meter cubes come out at a flow rate, 0 0.00. 225 meter cube per second, and this very rough estimate gives you <laughs> that's what the engineer should do. The mathematician's finished, but the engineer observes, oh, come on, that's pretty well just a straight line. Looks like uh, average flow would work pretty well here. And uh, guess what? That's almost four significant digits of agreement. Isn't it? So uh, both of those you should feel comfortable with. True.